the new theater of the mind. The Bruce Collins Show. Welcome back to The Bruce Collins Show. We're very glad to have you join us. Tonight, we'll talk to two authors. One is Gary S. Pritchett, the author of The Fallen Files. And also joining us later in the hour is Stephen Martin, the author of the new book, Worldview 2026. The Bruce Collins Show airs every Thursday night at 10 p.m. on WWPR, 1490 a.m. You can also catch the show on Fridays at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, online at ipbn-fm.com. That's ipbn-fm.com. Please tell your friends about The Bruce Collins Show, and you can join us on Facebook at the Bruce Collins Show page. If you'd like to contact us, you can email us at Bruce underscore Collins underscore show at AOL.com. Drop us a line and let us know how you're doing. The Bruce Collins Show also has a website, thebrucecollinsshow.com. And of course, The Bruce Collins Show also has a YouTube channel. Visit YouTube, search for The Bruce Collins Show channel, Subscribe and catch all the latest shows on YouTube. And by the way, we have another program called The Big Finale. You've probably heard of it now. Uh, We've done several weeks of it, and it is a great show. That show is on exclusively Monday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern Time on ipbn-fm.com. But here's the great news about the Bruce Collins Show YouTube channel. The Bruce Collins Show YouTube channel has episodes of The Bruce Collins Show and The Big Finale right there at The Bruce Collins Show channel on YouTube. So if you subscribe to The Bruce Collins Show channel on YouTube, you get both The Bruce Collins Show and The Big Finale. So that is an extra reason to subscribe. Folks, we have a great program this week. We've got two excellent guests. One is Gary S. Pritchett a breakout author with a breakout book called The Fallen Files. And we talked to Stephen Martin with a very interesting new book called Worldview 2026. And we'll talk about these subjects and more in a moment. And I have a great book to recommend to you this week. The The book is The Fallen Files, and it's written by Gary S. Pritchett. Now, this book, The Fallen Files by Gary S. Pritchett, is available on Amazon.com. You can buy it as an ebook for your Kindle. Gary S. Pritchett, welcome to The Bruce Collins Show. Hey, thank you very much for having me on. It's great to speak with you, Bruce. Yeah, it's great to speak to you. Now, before we get started... Just so people know, talk about where people can order this book, The Fallen Files, obviously Amazon.com, and or where people can find out either more information about you, Gary S. Pritchett, or The Fallen Files. Well, the um, the, the the main you know way to get the book is actually through Amazon, you know, dot com, and looking it up that way. It's on like you know all the major uh, outlets, Barnes and Noble as well. Um, how to get a hold of me? Um, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. Uh, the best way actually is either emailing um, through uh, it's GSP Digital Images at uh, gmail.com or through Facebook. I'm way too active on Facebook. And um, the Fallen Files, I set up a um, a page for the book as well, so can you know friend me, friend the book, and just start a conversation and go from there. Great. Now. Gary, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I actually am from the eastern shore of Maryland in, in the U.S., and um, I uh, left home at the age of 17 to go into the Navy, and uh, I was an intelligence specialist in the Navy. And I, Basically, before that, uh, what caused me to, uh, to really go into the military was you know, a little tribute to my dad. Um, he, uh, he, was an, he was a World War II veteran, and... 
from what I understand, had quite a few bullet holes. He was an amazing guy, and he passed away when I was really young through, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know that, you know, people that go through uh, situations like that, they come home with different, uh, you know, different things, and malaria really, you know, helped do him in. But um, I felt that I owed it to him, and I wanted to do something that he'd be proud of, so I uh, I enlisted and uh, became an intelligence specialist, and I was on two aircraft carriers. I was on the uh, uh, USS Independence and then the Coral Sea, and uh, pretty much went all around the world. Uh, I celebrated New Year in Singapore one year, and it was exactly wow. 12 hours earlier. So I, had, by the time I got home, I was waking up at, uh, at at noon and called some of my friends back in the on the East Coast, and they were just getting in with the celebration. So I walked the streets of Turkey. Um, so that's something pretty neat. Things that you see, you think that that's how they always are. But when I arrived in Turkey, there was a there was a guy with a bear on a chain right at the <laughs> right at the dock, and uh, you know I thought what an interesting thing that was. And uh, back when I got home, um, I I found a uh, a Turkish rug uh, retailer or seller. And um, he was actually from Turkey, and I had told him that story, and he was like, wow, that was such a brief snapshot in time. It was just a, a few years is all that guy was actually allowed to be out there. And um, so, you know, I came back home, and uh, I met a, met a fantastic girl from New Jersey, and she pulled me up to New Jersey, and um, we have a wonderful daughter, and pretty much going from there. Uh, excellent. Now, what caused you to write this book? The Fallen Files. It's very interesting because it's obviously a fictional book, but there are many elements in it that are arguably uh, nonfiction, and uh, and and some fascinating stuff that ties into a lot of what people call today fringe Christianity or the study of things that are touched on in the Bible, but then they're also explored in other uh, genres, other beliefs, other things. Um, they're maybe not quite mainstream in the church, but there are a lot of topics that are tied to things in Scripture. So it's a really interesting book, The Fallen Files. But for you personally, what caused you to write this book? Basically, um, listening to the Bible on a, a set of CDs that I got, or riding around. And it's like just all the stories, just actually hearing them flesh them out for me a little bit more, a little bit more. And, I, had, I still had so many questions, though, and uh, someone on Facebook actually invited me to uh, into a group the uh, uh, about the the Book of Enoch, and it's like, wow, what is this? That sounds really strange. That's that's not something that I've ever really heard of before. And I started, you know, reading that, and I realized that so many of the things that were going on that I thought were going on, you know, with uh, with the Bible and things that I had learned growing up just were a little bit different than I, than I thought. And there's so many other storylines about what the authors were actually, uh, what, what they knew as common knowledge that we think, you know, we pretty much look at our societal outlook on things now and think, you know, it's, you know, we're so quote unquote evolved now we've gotten so far and, uh, looking you know, looking back on what was really going on at, at different time periods, you realize that we really don't know what was going on then. So mm -hmm. it was basically the search to figure out what was going on at the time period and what could have caused, um, you know, a, 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 a wonderful God to say, you know, go out and destroy this whole tribe of people. And it's like when you really find out what was going on as far as like the fallen angels and Genesis, the, the, my mind was blown. So yeah. I really started just making notes. And initially, um, the first part of the book, I thought, you know, how could I get some of these stories across? So I decided to use uh, the names from biblical characters and try to keep a little bit of their um, biblical pr perspective going through in today's uh, today's world. And um, I, I really couldn't think of a way to really get it out there so much until I, uh, until I wondered, well, what would it be like if I, uh, just walked over to my computer and saw all these stories and things that I was thinking about actually typed on my screen? So it was like one of those light bulb moments. So I, I figured that if someone couldn't get away from thinking about the realities of what were going on and what are going on by 
a, a spirit, some specter that decided it wanted to be known and just started, you know, typing things on your computer and it was right there and you couldn't get away from it, then you would really start digging deeper into what what's really going on. And that is really what started the story. What what year? I'm I'm curious. What year for you uh, did did all of this start happening? Um, the book pretty much took it from uh, about 1990 on. Wow, wow! And so you were you were way ahead of a lot of us in terms of hearing about this stuff. Yeah, but I didn't know. You know, I really didn't know what was going. On. I just knew that things didn't sound completely right. You know, as far as there there were just too many just too many holes, and it's like. I, I, some of my friends, or the majority of my friends, like back then, um, I was, I was not, you know, a Christian at all. I really, I was spiritual. Like I've got Native American background and I knew I was spiritual. I knew that there were other things going on. Um, and then, you know, some things happened, you know, with me and I, I, uh, had a, you know, some personal trauma and I actually had a bit of an experience myself. And it's like, wow, I can't argue this. You know, there is something else. It's surprising that you, that you were looking into this so long ago because for me, I, I, it was actually one night listening to Coast to Coast AM and it was Patrick Heron and it was around 2005. And at the time I was doing book reviews for Monster Radio and I tried to get him on that show and I, I don't know how successful I would have been. There were a series of events that caused the host to leave the show and then I, I got boot booted off the program as a result because I was friends with him. But uh, I was trying to get Patrick Heron on the program. And then because all those things happened, lo and behold, a year later in 2006, I started my own program. So uh, you knew about this stuff a good 15 years before. I I mean, I, I had gone to church all my whole life. I was raised in church. My grandfather was a pastor. And uh, I never heard much about the Book of Enoch and and uh, Genesis 6 in, in terms of fallen angels. So it was kind of an eye-opening when I first heard Patrick Heron. He was really the opening for me to look into a lot of this stuff. Now, your book, The Fallen Files, again by Gary S. Pritchett, available on Amazon.com. Your book, The Fallen Files, is very fascinating. Can you give us a summary of what this book is all about? Sure. A lot of it is about the process of having your eyes opened, you know, quite honestly. Um, and realizing, you know, as we were, you know, discussing that there are so many other things that are really going on, you know, in the world. And, uh, through the, through the main character, he was a lonely guy, lost everything. And then all of a sudden he, uh, threw his job as a firefighter, you know, in the book. And he started seeing things. And uh, there was no denying that there was something else, you know, going on for him. And then as the uh, as his daily life progresses, he starts to talk about or think about it, seems anyway. And as he becomes more comfortable with himself, in, in, the, in the book, his character gains uh, different abilities as far as, like, strength or insight. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got the, uh, just out of the blue one day, he kind of brushed up against somebody and flashes of like um a, a movie started popping into his head and he has no idea what's real and what's not real with these things um and then he starts hearing voices as well so the thing is it sounds kind of crazy but the thing is um a lot of things go on in a person's life that they don't really understand at the time and then they just you know as long as you become you know confident with yourself and you know you're a nice person things usually work out okay and that's pretty much what happens through the book now, your central character, I, I think, is Joshua Edward Waters. In your book, The Fallen Files, uh, maybe uh, can you expand on that, uh, who he is, Joshua Edward Waters, and also is is any part of him you? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, you write about what you know, and then yeah. you read about what you don't know, and this is a combination of the two. Um he he's far, far more troubled than, you know, hopefully more troubled than I ever was. <laughs> But, um, the, uh, a lot of things that he actually went through and like the whole, you know, some of the experiences growing up, like questioning, like at an early age, he, he saw, you know, a family, you know, in a car. And it's like realizing that 
they had a life completely of their own, and nothing that they did affected him. Nothing that he did, nothing that he did affected them. They were completely, you know, separate uh, storylines kind of going on. And uh, this character, um, I didn't really think as much about it, you know, consciously as I was subconsciously. I think I, I know I wanted the Waters part um, to be a way for the. Uh, the, 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 the fallen character to try to, um, he wants redemption basically. And the, uh, the, the part about, you know, uh, Christianity as far as the whole baptism part and like, you know, so people think, you know, that there's so much strength in the blood and also in the water. So that the baptism thing, you know, is what really popped in and, uh, I already had the Joshua part. And I was going along and just writing, and then um, for I, I, his middle name became Edward, and I wasn't really sure why. I really didn't. I was thinking about it much deeper than I acknowledged to myself, I think. And then I just wrote it out one day, and I realized that his inu- initials um, basically reflected, you know, the J E W, huh. you know. Yeah. And it's like the whole thing, the you know, the parts of um, you know what was going on back in the Caleb and Joshua times. The interaction between him and the fallen angel, it's like Joshua kind of transitions into almost like a, a Saul turning into Paul type scenario. Mm-hmm. And um, then he you know, meets other people and uh, they kind of like climb on board, literally. He's driving around in a 65 El Camino. <laughs> and they everybody, you know, they kind of get on board and... Uh, he starts uh, just really not caring what people think anymore and starts really uh, embracing the whole uh, the you know, Christianity part and um, it brings on some interesting scenarios. Yeah. Now, we're speaking this week with Gary S. Pritchett, the author of The Fallen Files, and The Fallen Files by Gary S. Pritchett is available on Amazon.com. Now, uh Talk about some of the topics that are discussed in the Fallen Files that are that you weave into the story. Sure, sure. Well, partially, like the one of the first things that really uh, you know really comes out is that he's a firefighter and and he he sees things like in the the shadows and um, and he has no idea what it is and what's going on. And then that you know the whole other world, the whole supernatural world going on at the same time, um, he starts realizing that there are other forces going on. And uh, he, you know, starts, you know, realizing that there there are demons around and there are angels around. And um, then the uh, the shockingly enough, he finds out about grace like this, this, this character really uh that didn't really have that much of a uh, religious background. So he didn't really know about, you know, various things like grace and other things. So he starts for being forced to embrace them. And, uh, as he finds out things, he, um, learns the story of, uh, you know, Elijah and it's like how, you know, there are very few people that, um, that can say, you know, that they didn't die. You know, and Elijah and, and, uh, Enoch are a couple of right on that list, you know, going back through the biblical narrative anyway. And, uh, they actually, uh, meet up with a character that that could be, could be Elijah. (laughs) And, um, how the, the things that go on with, with life, it's like in chance meetings about, uh, in the, in the narrative or in the story, how he actually met someone, met someone, met a girl and, uh, that kind of was similar to my life about how just out of nowhere, you know, I just met a, met a girl that I, I uh, write that into the book too. And, um, then my personal, you know, questions about the, the supernatural, you know, and what's always around, like, I, you know, a lot of people have seen things, but mm-hmm. it's like, what if you really saw them all the time? Like this character does. And, um, what, what is real? Like, are there really vampires and are there really, um, like black eyed kids and things like that? So I tried to weave a lot of questions and what ifs into the book and, uh, just as like an adventure type, you know, epic. It, it's an interesting thought that you have because 
I was thinking about that too, and as far as questions to ask you, and one of them that I have is if we could see the supernatural around us with our physical eyes, what do you think the world would look like? And as I'm sitting here thinking of that, you, you'd almost think that God allowing us all to see that would almost take away free will because you would, I think, instantly become a Christian if you could see the demonic world around you, you know, if you weren't saved. Um, But also, on the flip side of that, as a Christian, it might actually build your faith to know what was around you and what was protecting you and what was going before you. So there could be multiple effects of that. But it it almost seems like it would remove free will, and maybe that's why m- most people, you know, don't see that. Now, of course, there are a lot of people who see things in the spirit world that are sort of unprotected because they're dabbling in these things, or they're they're coming across something that is either is dwelling in a home or something like that. Anyway, the the bigger picture: if we could see around us with our physical eyes, what do you think the world around us would look like? I think a lot of it would be based on your perspective as far as what is good and what is evil. And I don't really think that everybody would be, like you were saying, allowed to see everything. Because it, I can't imagine just how distracting that would be on a daily basis to see, um, you know, see things that are possibly, you know, through other dimensions that are like popping in and out. You know, the, yeah. the last I, the last I heard, um, physicists now think that there are possibly like 11 different dimensions going on at the same time. I think some of these things actually pop in and out, you know, between the two. And um, they intention, I, I think God intentionally doesn't allow you to see everything. Some, some people, I think that the veil of that veil of protection or that veil um, is thinner and they actually see things like, you know, you, you hear stories of, of kids actually um, beings talking to them, and it's really scary that that would that would happen. You know, with children, but I think that uh, if we could see things that that were going on, you know, supernaturally all the time, like like you were saying, I think it would be really hard to um, to keep it together for most people, and. I think that actually that's part of um, the scary part about the the New Age movement. So even though this is a fictional book, quote unquote fictional, because there are a lot of themes in here that are that are nonfiction, it, it has a lot of Christian themes, obviously. So what would you say is the general idea or or the general theme? You know, I've asked authors before if somebody could get one big idea from your book, what would it be? So what would be like the big general theme of this book? That there's so much more going on than you really know. Mm-hmm. And you're going to go through life. You're going to, you know, most, most people, they, they start out of, you know, as children and knowing one thing. And then um, I, I'm not sure what happens with a lot of people. They kind of like give up on uh, the mystery of life and the seeing the details and things. I think people kind of give up on the, the, the magic of what's really going on. And that would be like the main thing that I would say. It's like, just, just relax a little bit. Things are going to happen from time to time. Just, uh, you know, if you, if you're lucky enough to find people that, uh, see things through the same lens as you, great. You know, if not, then don't let things get to you and just be, you know, positive and just uh, realize that there is more going on than than you know, and it it all ends okay. Yeah. So there are going to be a lot of missteps along the way, but just don't dwell on them. Just look at the positive aspects and just kind of keep chipping away. Now, this has been fa- a fascinating interview again with Gary S. Pritchett, the author of The Fallen Files. Gary, thank you so much. This has been awesome. Oh, thank you very much, Bruce. This has been wonderful for me as well. You go a little deeper than I than I than I thought it would go. It's awesome.
The scientist calls them individuated units of consciousness, but to author Stephen Holly Martin, a Christian, souls is a more descriptive moniker. The physicist says they're on Earth and have bodies in order to evolve and thereby reduce their entropy. Stephen Martin spent two years interviewing experts on the cutting edge of their disciplines, including psychiatrists, psychologists, quantum physicists, near-death survivors and researchers, and those studying paranormal phenomena. He maintains it's apparent a new worldview is rapidly emerging and the scientific materialist view that took hold following publication of Darwin's Origin of Species is headed to the dustbin of history. One result of his efforts is a new book, Worldview 2026, Opportunity for a Christian Renaissance, the foreword of which was written by James G. Somerville, Ph.D., senior pastor of Richmond, Virginia's First Baptist Church, one of the largest in the Mid-Atlantic. Stephen Holly Martin, welcome to The Bruce Collins Show. Well, thank you, Bruce. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Again, the book is Worldview 2026, Opportunity for a Christian Renaissance. So what led you, I, I assume partly what led you as you became a Christian, but what led you to write this book specifically, Worldview 2026? Well, what happened, uh, Bruce, I, uh, I was very interested in metaphysics, I was, and uh, I had the opportunity to be a talk show host, kind of like you're doing now, but uh, the, the uh, name of the show was The Truth About Life. It was a, a weekly podcast kind of thing on webtalk, webtalkradio.net, mm -hmm. and uh, I interviewed authors that were researching uh, the nature reality, everything from quantum physicists to paranormal researchers. I think you mentioned a little bit of this in your in your introduction. And um, hundreds of them, really. And what I saw coming out of all that was a, a new world view that is emerging that uh, a lot of people are catching on to, but still so many people caught in the uh, the old traditional scientific materialist worldview. And at the same time, I married a, a good Christian woman, and I didn't have anything against the Christian church. I was going to church with her. We brought our children up as Christians. And, you know, I found it interesting. I uh, attended Bible studies and so forth. And But what happened is we got a new preacher about the same time that I was doing this radio show. And he, the things he was saying, I was beginning to see that what Jesus was talking about and what he he was preaching about, what he was teaching, what he was trying to get people to do, was the truth. That it was what I was learning through all this metaphysical study. That, uh, you know, love God, love your neighbor, um, turn the other cheek, all those things that, uh, that he taught. Mm -hmm. And eventually I said, well, you know, this, uh, I, I need to, Follow Jesus. I mean, he is uh, the truth, the way and the life, as he said, the way to the Father. And uh, it was a Baptist church, not a Southern Baptist, but a, a Baptist church. And you may know that the doctrine of the Baptist church is priesthood of the believer. In other words, there's no priest between you and God, no set doctrine you have to subscribe to between you and God. The belief is that it's between the believer and God, what is real and what the Bible is trying to tell us and so forth. And so I said, well, that, that's for me. And I, I took the plunge, got baptized, and now I'm a Baptist. <laughs> that's awesome. So I thought I would write a book about all that and what led me to it, and that's really what the book is about. Yeah. So you have a chapter in Worldview 2026 at the beginning of your book about a scientific theory that supports Jesus' teachings. Can you talk about this? I'll be happy to. That's, that's 
great question. Um, and let me say that the I'm not uh, totally convinced that this is the way it is. This guy's theory, his name is Thomas Campbell. He wrote an 824-page book, I can tell you. <laughs> he, he's got a lot of detail in the 824 pages. But I will say that it is probably a whole lot closer to the truth than what the uh, scientific materialist traditionalist science has put out and has taught, been teaching in, in the universities for the last hundred years, I guess. Well, there's a quote that I'd like to start out with, and I think I put it in the book, uh, that says to the effect a guy named Rupert Sheldrake, who has a theory that I also talk about in, in the book, uh, says that modern science is based on the principle, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. And the one free miracle is the appearance of all the matter and the energy of the universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. And, of course, he's talking about the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. Well, it stands to reason that that's impossible. There had to be something before the Big Bang, and uh, scientists don't even have a theory about that because, for them, nothing can exist besides matter. That's what scientific materialism is. But Thomas uh, Campbell uh, is also a physicist, and he believes, and his theory states, that everything came from what he calls primordial consciousness. He bases his theory really on on two uh, on two uh, I've forgotten the word, but one is that uh, what he calls the fundamental process, which mm -hmm. is the process of evolution of, of uh, everything is, is in a state of change. Inanimate objects uh, find the lowest state of energy. It's called entropy. You know, if you wind up a toy that's got a spring in it, it's going to unwind. That's what happens with uh, physical objects. Life, uh, animate objects, uh, organisms, want to reproduce, and they want to uh, find what he calls lower states of entropy, which is to evolve, to, to become more, uh, he says, eventually to seek the state of love, which is in evolution, you know, something that's necessary, a bird or a dog or a cat, animal has to love its young and care for them or they won't survive. And eventually, if we all love each other and have that uh, between us, we will, um, we will create a better world. And yeah. this lowers our entropy. We don't, we're not as scattered crazy, you know, beating up on each other, that <laughs> kind of thing. And, uh, he says that what happened is the uh, primordial consciousness created units of consciousness. You mentioned those in your introduction. Mm -hmm. That, uh, And he's got a YouTube video that explains this where he uses a, a kind of a metaphor. He says, imagine that there's a sheet, a bed sheet that is like, a, like, our, like the consciousness, this primordial consciousness. And two children want to play, and they stick their hands in the sheet. They put rubber bands around their hands, and they create puppets. Well, those puppets are us. They're the uh, spiritual offspring of this sheet. And that eventually, uh, as more and more were created and they interacted, uh, they got to a point where they were no longer evolving, and so... This uh, primordial consciousness, which I call God, decided to make physical reality because that would be a way to create kind of a school for us to come to, mm -hmm. to learn. And so uh, the Big Bang occurred, and eventually we have Earth, and we have uh, evolution that's 
it's gotten to where it is today, and these uh, these spiritual beings, which we are each one, come into physical reality. Talk about your findings into evidence for an afterlife. Oh gosh, well there are lots. Um, there are lots, and again, interviewing people, both uh, near death survivors, uh, people who experienced that, but also um, the University of Virginia uh, in their medical school in the uh, department, I think they call it perceptual studies or something like that, but it's actually psychiatrists who treat children who have uh, mental issues, uh, has been studying memories of past lives with children since 1960. The guy who who started that was named Ian Stevenson. I think he died back in 2007 or something like that. But uh, And then his work has been carried on by a fellow named Jim B. Tucker. These children have memories of past lives that they have checked out. And they have a file, it's been over 50 years, of over 2,600 cases that have checked out. Now, they will be quick. I've interviewed Jim B. Tucker on my show a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Uh, He will not say that reincarnation is something that happens to everybody necessarily, but he will say it does happen to some people at least, and particularly uh, those who had lives cut short for some reason, uh, or died uh, some sort of traumatic death. Uh, One case was a pilot who was shot down in World War II who uh, came back uh, around the year 2000, I think the boy's 16 or so now, who uh, remembered all kinds of things, like the name of the aircraft carrier he was flying off of, where... It happened, I mean, people's names. He went to reunion of his shipmates. Uh, he said, oh, gosh, they're all so old, <laughs> and things like that. So anyway, reincarnation happens at least in some cases. Mm-hmm. Then another... From, from a Christian... Uh, per- I'm, I'm curious just, just about that, because I... I- I guess I take a more traditional, you know, Christian view of that. But sure. this is this is not a debate show, but I love discussing this type of stuff because it's fascinating to me. But let me ask you this. Why why do you think if if reincarnation was so, why do you think God would do that? In in other words, why would God have someone who was just recycling through this life rather than going on to the next one? What would be the purpose of that? Well, I don't think that when you're reincarnated, most people don't remember the previous life. Mm -hmm. And those who do, the children who do, usually uh, forget it by the time they're six or seven. Right. I think that the the reason for it, if you were God, is, and I'm sure you've heard this argument, what about somebody who is born into an... uh, in Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. and uh, by chance, born there, grows up, they never hear about Christianity, or if they do, they've heard that it's a, a terrible thing. They mm-hmm. never had a chance, really, to follow Christ. If they were, Suppose they were born at the uh, top of a mountain in, in uh, Tibet. Right. There are a lot of people who are born, never have a chance to know Jesus. Right. Uh, shouldn't they get an opportunity, or should they spend eternity in hell? I mean, it doesn't seem quite fair. Then there are people who, like these children, whose lives are cut short. This guy, James Leninger, I was talking about there, the uh, fighter pilot, World War II, he's 20 years old, gets shot down over Iwo Jima. He really, his life is not, hardly has begun. He gets another chance. So why wouldn't there be at least second chances for people in situations like that? I think that would be one argument. And then the one that Thomas uh, Campbell puts forth in his theory 
is that it really is a way for us to evolve and to grow up and to become loving and to learn to love God and learn to love our neighbors. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that if you're a good Christian and you do all those things and you follow Christ, you, you, maybe I hope you don't get reincarnated. I hope I don't. Yeah. But anyway, that that. And, and could I answer those two points? Uh, um, yeah, please do. It, yeah, just as a discussion. It's not a debate. But um, I would answer those this way. No, number one, it's my understanding reincarnation that, by and large, you don't know that you existed previously. That being the case, that wouldn't necessarily increase your chances to to become a Christian, I wouldn't think, uh, and, unless God sends somebody your way in, in a second lifetime. But the other thing is, there are passages like Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, that say it's appointed for men once to die, and then after that, the judgment. And that would seem to address all of mankind. And, and also, Christ himself described death as God requiring man's soul, Luke twelve twenty. So it, from my perspective, I don't see that as, as being part of it. But then the other part was reincarnation, the second second part you stated was reincarnation was a way to kind of work out your, uh, I guess, your, to earn something. But really, from a Christian's perspective, there's no earning. It's, it's you know, John, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins. Nobody is perfect, and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And through God's grace, your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow, though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. That's Isaiah 118. So, and he, and he even says in Hebrews, again, going back to Hebrews chapter 8, I will remember their sins no more. So it's like for me, I'm not a perfect person. I make mistakes, you know, and all of that. But my expectation is when I leave this earth, I'm, I'm leaving by the grace of God, not through anything that I've earned. I just want to make sure that the listener knows there is a, there's a, a traditional Christian belief there, and then there's an, another belief that reincarnation is real popular in Buddhism, but it's not really in Christianity, right? Oh, I, I agree. And, and as I said, it was, it was stricken from the uh, church doctrine back in 553. And I, to, to speak to what you're saying, I agree that you don't earn your way to heaven, that it is, uh, you know, uh, forgiveness. You confess your thin, sins, you, you recant. I, I believe that too. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that you have to do certain things or become a certain way or whatever to, to get to heaven. I, I'm certainly imperfect. Yeah, and you and I, you and I are brothers in Jesus Christ. There's no doubts about that. We're just having a discussion, you know, so. Uh, but I, I will say that there's evidence and, and one of the, I think I mentioned this in my book, I know I've done it in one or more, where I, I interviewed a Baptist preacher mm-hmm. who uh, whose name escapes me right now. But he had been uh, a minister on the Las Vegas Strip. And he, inter- he ministered to a lot of showgirls and people that were kind of, you know, like Jesus and the... <laughs> Yeah. Sort of people that he associated with. Right, right. And he heard a lot about uh, reincarnation because a lot of these folks were kind of uh, followers or, or interested in Edgar Casey. I don't know if you know yes. who he was, but uh, he uh, was actually a very strong Christian himself, read the Bible once every year, every uh, once through every, for every year he was alive, um, starting when he was 17. But he uh, talked a lot about reincarnation in, in the um, what he called reading psychic readings that he gave. So anyway, this guy had heard a lot about that, didn't believe it, and decided to write a book that debunked using both biblical uh, sources. And when he got into it and started reading, particularly the New Testament, with uh, the idea of reincarnation in mind. He saw a lot of things in there that uh, that indicated to him that well maybe maybe it is true. I mean, for example, people uh, his, his disciples, Jesus' disciples asked uh, Jesus asked them once uh, who people thought he was, 
and they said, well, some say you're one of the prophets, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're, you know, whatever else. And when, one of the, when the last prophet had died 400 years before Jesus, so if he was one of the prophets, he had to have been reincarnated. Well, Jesus yeah, also, but do you do you believe that Jesus was reincarnated? I don't know. I don't. I, I see. I I think that Jesus was sent by God uh, to Earth, and mm-hmm. that's what I believe about Jesus. I yeah. believe he was uh, the Son of God. Yeah. Another passage. And, I, another passage but, I didn't bring up was Second Corinthians five eight, which says, "To be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord." But we both believe that because we believe that. Well, absolutely, yeah. and you know, you, you said earlier uh, about be, the judgment, live once in judgment. I believe you are judged each time. If you are born more than once, you're gonna you're gonna be live once, and you're gonna be judged. That's part but of that, what, but uh, doesn't but wouldn't that negate salvation? In other words, in, in other words, well, it's not it's not so much. I think you judge yourself. Yeah, you judge you. You have a life review, and you see what you did right, and you see what you did wrong, and you actually feel what you created in others. In other words, if they have, were disappointed in you, you feel that. Yeah. If you hurt them, you feel that. It's not God. Or Jesus saying, you know, you're a bad guy. It's you realizing what you did. Yeah. Let's talk about um, spirit possession. Do you think there's evidence of people being possessed by spirits? Uh, I do. Um, and the reason I do is that I've talked to at least, well, two psychiatrists, and one of them a couple of times, again, on my uh, radio show, where... And one of them is, is from India, um, and she stumbled on this, where what she had was someone who, you know, was acting schizophrenic or whatever, <laughs> psychotic. Yeah. And uh, she hypnotized them, and then she started, was able to converse with the entity that had obsessed or possessed this person. And I'll tell you what her theory is. Her theory is, and this also substantiated, or at least similar to the other psychiatrist Mm -hmm. theory, that what happens when we die, you know, if we're a Christian, then we know we're going to heaven, and that's what happens, Mm -hmm. okay? You know, we see the light, we go through the tunnel, we see the light, we arrive in this great white realm, which... um, some people call the reception area, whatever. And you meet friend, you know, people who've gone before, and your maybe your mother and father, whatever, who's already passed. And maybe you actually meet Jesus, like the the boy who uh, had the near death experience. Uh, heaven is for real. Well, if you're not a Christian and you don't think there's an afterlife, then you're kind of confused. Here you are, you're outside of your body, you don't don't really understand what's going on, you kind of wander around. And if you would look up and look for the light, you'd see it, but they don't. And so what the psychiatrist says is people like that, who have that experience, will try to find some place to go. And often they find someone, and usually it's someone who has been weakened in some way, physically if not mentally. You know, maybe they've, they're they sick, maybe they were injured and had a car accident or something, and they'll kind of latch on to that person. Mm-hmm. And they both say there's different degrees of this. There's um, obsession, which is, you know, where... You're just influenced by that entity. And possession, where they really take over at least part of the time. Yeah. And uh, they also say that they believe that, and these people are not religious, okay? Yeah. They're not Christians, necessarily. I mean, one of them might have been, but she didn't approach it from that standpoint. They believe that Satan does exist, that he is, uh, well, 
kind of like Milton uh, Paradise Lost, where uh, he's rebelling against God. He's he's he wants to be his God yeah. himself, and so he's trying to collect his own uh, followers, and he has collected some. And that that kind of possession also does exist, but it's very rare. There's a book by a Catholic priest. I'm not sure he's still alive. He wrote this book almost 40 years ago, which I read, called, um, uh, gosh, the, the guy's name is Martin Malachi. And he gives five case histories of spirit possession by uh, Satan. Uh, I wish you remember the name of the book. But absolutely scary stuff. And another book, uh, People of the Lie, by Scott Peck, talks about evil and spirit possession. He was a psychiatrist, and he witnessed a couple of uh, exorcisms. And absolutely, he also wrote The Road Less Traveled, which was quite a famous book 30 years ago. Yeah. But anyway, to answer your question, yes, I do believe in it. In Luke chapter 16, there's a story of Jesus talking about uh, a rich man who dies and and Lazarus also uh, who dies. And the rich man went to hell, essentially, and, the, and Lazarus went to heaven. And the rich man was asking uh, if Lazarus could dip his finger in the water and, and give him water. So it showed their res- Christ was talking about their respective rewards following death. The rich man who lived a greedy life went to hell. The poor man, uh, the beggar who who obviously lived some kind of a godly life went to heaven. That's That's basically what the story is. You just said that people who can't find heaven find a uh, a person to enter into and but there's two kinds in other words there's demonic i guess evil and also these human souls that can't so if the human souls go into people's bodies it, do you believe there's a hell that exists and if so who goes there okay um yeah i don't think that everybody who is an atheist or whatever doesn't believe in heaven uh goes around as messy people i think Poltergeist, you know, a haunted house, haunted castle, <laughs> those things do exist. Yeah. But to answer your question, uh, is there a hell? Yes. I've talked with one gentleman on, on my show who uh, had been a gang member and a really bad guy and had a near-death experience and went to hell and... Uh, Came, came back, I mean, he, he was revived, he was resuscitated. And he is now a Christian minister. Um, so, and then, then I've talked with other people who um, say they have seen hell. I mean, these are people who uh, do out-of-body travel kind of stuff, you know, the yeah. Monroe Institute, if you're familiar with that. And so, uh, yeah, I think they're is a hell. What I don't know is whether it's for eternity or whether it's, you know, I I think that it is as the Bible describes it. What I don't know is whether it's for eternity. I just don't know. Yeah. It seems to me that one of the things Edgar Casey said, of course, is that we're all going to make it eventually. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, that would mean even Satan would make it eventually. You know, eventually we're going to get our act together. But who knows? I don't know. Yeah. And the book is Worldview 2026, Opportunity for a Christian Renaissance. Stephen Martin. Stephen, I uh, hope you keep in touch, and I would love to have you back sometime. This has been a fascinating discussion. I'd love to come back. Thank you very much, Bruce. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you once again for joining us here on the Bruce Collins Show, where we broadcast every Thursday night at 10 p.m. right here at WWPR, 1490 a.m. Remember, God loves you. We do, too. Don't give up.